Let's get started. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the um, uh, 2016 uh, Waltinsky Lecture of the Department of Economics. I'm Paul Rohde, the chair of the department. This lecture is given to the recipient of the W.S. Watinsky Lectureship Award. This was created in 1963 through the generosity of Elma Watinsky to honor her husband. Um, the award recognizes the person who has made outstanding contributions in the field of economics. Uh, Vladimir Waltinsky was a distinguished economist who is considered one of the architects of the U.S. social security system. He was born in Russia in 1885. Um, he was active in the underground movement against the Tsar. He was sent to exile in Siberia in 18 or 1908. So. Um, he became involved in the Russian Revolution and was in Lenin's inner circle. And then, like many, he left Lenin's inner circle <laughs> and was exiled. So he moved to uh, Soviet or to Georgia, not our state, but the country, and then to Germany. In Germany, he wrote a number of important books in economics, including the United States of Europe, which is kind of a contemporary type of topic. He immigrated with his wife to the United States in uh, 1933, and he worked in Washington as one of the architects of the Social Security Board, which was started, and he served on, in the Social Security system until 1947. While he worked at the board, he collaborated with the Michigan economist Bill Haber, and he moved to Ann Arbor and wrote, or excuse me, he wrote two books, uh, World Population and Production in 1953, and World Commerce and Government in 1955. He died in 1960, so some time ago. His uh, autobiography, uh, Stormy Passage, was uh, published uh, posthumously a year later. Um, and his wife donated uh, his books and papers to our library, which you can consult, and then donated the money to create this lectureship. This lectureship has uh, had many distinguished presenters. So the first lecture was given by Gary Becker, and that is where the book on human capital came from. So in the lectureship, there have been five Nobel Prize winners, um, including, I won't list them all, but including, and, and among many other members. Um, so Robert Barrow has presented, Tom Sargent, Peter Diamond, Zeev Grillicus, Jim Heckman, Claudia Golden, Angus Deaton, Bob Hall, and most recently, Susan Athey. This year, we're delighted to have Hal Varian, another economic superstar. Many people know Hal as the chief economist at Google. Um, he was recently called, in a New York Times article, the godfather of the, high, of the tech industry's in-house economists. So he moved over to Google on a part-time basis in 2002, um, and then he is essentially the pioneer of this movement of economists, including Susan Athey, over to the candy store. So I guess you're the godfather of the candy store. Um, he had been, uh, prior to this move, uh, at Berkeley, he had gotten his uh, PhD at Berkeley. Um, uh, he had gotten his uh, uh, bachelor at MIT and took a job at um, MIT after <coughs> getting his PhD. Uh, so in this period, a lot of people know him as this godfather. Um, you also know him from books such as Information Rules, uh, which he wrote with Carl Shapiro at uh, Berkeley. And then a lot of us know him from his textbooks. Um, so his intermediate micro textbook, which we have on the shelf over here. And then I brought my own, because I didn't know if we had this, his graduate textbook, um, the red book over there. So these are all very famous. Uh, these are, uh, he's written 10 books. These are just three of those. And he's written hundreds of articles. Or well, including his uh, popular articles, hundreds of articles. 
What people don't know or doesn't appear so much is that he was here at Michigan for a good long time. Okay, so he's up there in the very top. I should have a pointer here, I guess. Um, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> well, that didn't. Okay. He's up in the very top behind Harold Shapiro. Um, Harold Shapiro uh, was here in the department and became president of Princeton. So the, the smiling suited man is Harold Shapiro. The man hiding behind him is Hal Variant. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, um, I, I can't speak to that. He is a fellow of the Guggenheim Foundation, the Econometric Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's been co-editor of the American Economic Review, and he is a just gave a distinguished or uh, lectureship for the American Economics Association. We're very pleased to welcome back to Ann Arbor Hal Variant to speak on Google Tools for Data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I promise I'm going to make a lecture you can't refuse. And by the way, this does take me back to uh, today's of Teaching 401 here at uh, University of Michigan because nobody's sitting in the front row except the faculty <laughs> members. Mm. So the topic is positive feedback in economics? I don't know. Anyway, uh, I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about some tools that we've developed at Google. And what I want to talk about in particular are three tools that are available. Google Trends, Google Correlate, and Google Consumer Surveys. Three very nice tools. And I want to start out with a little quiz for the assembled group here. Which day of the week are there the most searches for hangover? Okay. Which day of the week? How many, how many people say Monday? Okay, I see we have some party animals back there in the back. <laughs> now it turns out that the day of the week when the most searches for hangover turns out to be Sunday. And uh, the way you find that out is you go to Google and you go to Google Trends and you can look at the index on the queries on any term you want. So here's a picture of the queries on hangover and all those little bumps there are Sunday. And that great big bump is January 1st, New Year's Day. <laughs> okay? And in fact, if you uh, look at, scroll down a bit, you can see the regional uh, interests, okay? And you'll see there that New York is the hangover capital of the US, which is fitting, I think, kind of nice. And you can also see the popular search terms, which are cure hangover, hangover cures, cure a hangover, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you a nice little picture of what things look like for that particular query. Now you can also combine queries. So you can look at plots with multiple queries. Here's one, for example, with vodka queries in red and hangover queries in blue. Okay, so you see there's exactly a one day leading indicator. <laughs> <coughs> that big peak is on December 31st, New Year's Eve. So if you're ever teaching Granger causality, this is the perfect example. You can't get much better than that. So here's a nice one. This is searches for civil war. Okay, civil war, it's in the US, so I assume it's a US civil war. There are two notable features. One is it declines very, very regularly. So you have this downward trend. And also it has a very, very strong seasonal pattern. So you see this repeating year after year after year. Why is that? Well, it turns out the downward trend is easy. If you go back on the internet 10 years ago, there was a much bigger presence of EDU, and you take almost any scholarly or academic term, and you'll see it declining over time, and if you take anything that's Hollywood and gossip, you'll see it increasing over time as the internet has become a more popular medium. So that's not too surprising. But the regular pattern, what is that all about? Well, this peak, Right here, you see, every professor knows that's three days before the term papers do. <laughs> and in fact, if you don't believe me, let's look at the queries on term paper, which look exactly like that. So now, here's a nice one. This is really fun. This is gift for boyfriend, 
and gift for girlfriend. And if you look at that, there's the gift for boyfriend, there's the gift for girlfriend, here's Christmas, and then here's Valentine's Day coming up, and you can tell a whole little story about this, very sweet, but look what happens when they get married. <laughs> You can almost see these poor guys sitting there saying, gift for wife, gift for wife, help me Google. And uh, Valentine's Day is still a little echo of it there, not quite what it used to be, all right? So you can see there's a lot of stories here. This is a more serious one. This is the Greek referendum, remember the Grexit? So the question then is, there are a whole bunch of queries in Greek, many of which were no's, many of which were yes, and the uh, Greek economist, Nikos Askitas here, said, let's look and see how well this does in predicting the election. Now what's interesting, the Google Trends data is available on an hourly basis. So you can look at hourly changes as the election ticks on here. And here's a picture of what the yes votes in green and the no votes in red look like. Here's a ratio of the two here. And, uh, Askitas called the election at 60% voting no, and the actual share ended up being 61%. So it was really quite a remarkable prediction from looking at that, uh, that data. The other tool I'm gonna to talk about is Google Correlate. And to give you an example of what that does, it uses the same data set, it uses the trends data set, but it's looking for correlations in that data. So you can feed in any term or you can feed in any time series or any cross-section data, cross-state data, and find out what terms are most correlated with it. So here's an example. We fed in weight loss. What's most correlated with weight loss? Well, it turns out one of them is best vacation spots. When people start planning their best vacation spots, apparently they also think about losing some weight. And here's a picture of what that time series looks like, where you have this big, big peak on New Year's Day writing down your resolutions, one of which might be weight loss. And uh, then you see this pattern, which shows you how uh, queries evolve on that particular term. You can also look at leads and lags. So you might ask yourself, what's the most popular query three weeks after the weight loss query? And it turns out, there it is, not losing weight. <laughs> weight loss plateau, and so on and so on. Again, kind of little vignette of uh, human experience all wrapped up in that piece of technology. And oh, there's the three week shift series by three weeks, okay? Now, with these tools, I've shown you some of the fun and interesting things you can do. But also, there's a lot of serious things you can do because you can look at things like unemployment. What's the first thing you would do if you became unemployed? You go to Google and say, where's the unemployment office? When is the office open? How long? What are the hours? What do I need? If you look at home sales, you might be querying on real estate agents and then a few months later, a few weeks later, you might be buying a house. So there's lots of intention that's signaled by those queries and we can use that intention to make interesting uh, estimates or forecasts or predictions about what's going to actually uh, occur. So here's an example. Most of this is going to be now casting. You know, as Yogi Berra said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, but it's still worthwhile just to do predictions of what's happening now, because lots of economic data is released with a lag. So if you're looking at, uh, let's say, unemployment queries now, that's predictive of unemployment activity now, and the actual numbers won't be released till, let's say, a month from now. So you want to have a real-time signal that helps you predict the official, the official numbers, a little bit in advance. Now in some cases, it can be quite a bit in advance. For example, that is vacation planning. So if you're issuing queries uh, about your vacation, you may be doing that in March or April. It doesn't actually happen until July or August, and then you've got something that's a real prediction. So you want to ask yourself, how does the query time relate to the activity time? How does it relate to the expenditure, or whatever the metric is that you're measuring? So here's an example where I'm using uh, the initial claims for unemployment benefits. So if you become unemployed, you'd go down to the unemployment office, and those are tracked on a weekly basis. Initial claims are the black line, and the red line is the headline uh, unemployment rate. So you just think about 
water flowing into the sink, that's the initial claims, water flowing out of the sink, that's people getting jobs, and the level of water in the sink is the unemployment rate. So what happens here is you notice that the initial claims peaks right at the end of every recession, which is pretty impressive. Pretty impressive for economic forecasting, except when you realize that economists get to define when recession ends, and one of the metrics they look at is initial claims. So it's not quite as impressive as you might uh, hope. Another thing is you can see the initial claims tend to peak about uh, six months before the actual unemployment rate, so they're helpful in indicating uh, when it looks like the uh, unemployment has uh, maxed out. So it'd be useful to be able to forecast, to now cast those initial claims for unemployment benefits. And indeed, if you take the data, the non-seasonally adjusted initial claims, and just feed it into Google Correlate and say, find me the queries that are the most correlated with that, you get all these Michigan unemployment, Idaho unemployment filing, New Jersey unemployment, and so on and so on. So it's quite uh, suggestive that those numbers are indeed predictive of what the initial claims will look like. And in fact, here's what the plot looks like. You can see this very strong seasonal effect. That's when people who are working over the holiday season are laid off in January and go file for initial claims. Here's the recession, of course, the Great Recession. You can see a pretty strong uh, relationship between those two series. So if you predict in initial claims using just lag values of initial claims and contemporaneous queries on the what did I use? I used unemployment filing here, which was one of the predictors. Baseline, which would be a very simple autoregressive model, namely just looking at last week's initial claims and what they were 52 weeks ago to capture that seasonality. And then say, how much extra boost do we get by adding in that initial claims uh, query issue, namely unemployment filing queries. And it turns out you get a significant improvement in the R squared. Now some people said, oh, that's too simple a model, just one of those trivial uh, autoregressive models. You can also use one of these uh, fancier ARIMA models, and you'll see there that you do get the same kind of uh, a boost. So generally, you'll get an improvement by using this data uh, in many uh, cases, and this is just one example. Now, that case, it was kind of obvious, right? We fed the data in to correlate. We picked one of the queries. We said, let's see how well it works. But what if you wanted to try to figure out the best forecasting model? Now, there's little quotes around the best there because uh, the best depends on what your, on your objective function. But if you try to find a good forecasting model, how do you choose the best predictors? Because after all, there are millions and millions of queries, and there's only a few hundred observations. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to build a regression where we're trying to predict hundreds of observations using millions of predictors. Now they may have told you that you shouldn't do that. That's a bad thing to do in your kind of metrics class. But the problem is we're drowning in data now. So we're always facing this problem. There's a lot of potential predictors in many cases in a relatively short series or relatively small series to predict. So we want to face that problem, come up with some way of doing model selection in a principled manner. And so there's lots of choices, simple correlation, judgment, stepwise regression, lasso, which is a machine learning technique, elastic net, LARS, et cetera. We use something called spike and slab regression. And the way that works, it's a Bayesian method. We have a probability that a variable is included and then conditional on being included, what the probability distribution of its coefficient value is, okay? So it's a particular technique that you can use. We like it because it's very flexible. And what we can do here is we can build a, a Kalman filter, which captures a trend in seasonality in the series. And then we build this spike and slab regression, which picks the best regressors for us. And it's just like automating writing economics papers. You can just feed, this, uh, <laughs> feed these predictors in. You can sort of name the thing you want, and it will say, hey, here's the best model. Best model in a, in a probabilistic sense. So we've written this up in a few papers. It's a standard method that was developed in the, uh, in the late 90s, but we also developed a nice uh, R package that allows you to do this, uh, do this yourself. So the way you think about it is you have a model which is composed of a trend component, a seasonal component, and a regression component. 
These are adaptive non-parametric methods. You can add other components like holidays or things of that sort. And uh, then we pick the model that's the best model, the most predictive model for this particular uh, set of data. And we're important innovation here is we're, we're accounting for this time series structure. So seasonality is really going to be important. Trend is really going to be important. And so what you end up with is a way to look at uh, component by component contributions to the predictors. So uh, seasonality, well here's a nice one. Uh, you'll often find when you're doing time series that there will be spurious correlation. So it turns out civil war and red kangaroo are correlated very highly. Uh, and that's partly because they're both good topics for term papers, like I talked about earlier. So we don't expect to see any independent uh, causal relationship here. What we're seeing is we're seeing this uh, common cause, namely the seasonality that's shown in that picture. And this shows up for a lot of things. Auto sales, bathing suits, baseball games, uh, summer, other sorts of summer activities. Etc. Does Google data help explain the initial claims? I was showing this earlier. There I just picked out that one uh, unemployment filing as my uh, predictor, but we can automate that. What we can do is we can say let's find the trends that are in fact the most predictive, build the best regression model we can using those uh, queries. So we get out little model here where you see the trend, that's this part, that's what you get from a pure time series regression. We see the seasonal component, which is showing you that Christmas effect. And then here's the regression component, which is really quite big, so it suggests that the regression is in fact quite helpful in describing the series. So it gives you this nice uh, decomposition of the series into the, um, into the constituent parts. So here when we run it, unfortunately this, we have a little resolution mismatch, but it says unemployment office is the most probable predictor, that is the most likely to be in, the, in this uh, regression. Filing for unemployment, Idaho unemployment, serious internet radio, serious internet radio, well that's pretty likely a spurious, uh, spurious predictor here, but it has only a about a 10% chance of uh, showing up. So the dark means it shows up negatively and the length of the bar indicates uh, how, uh, how likely it is to be uh, included. And just, just to, as a little technical aside, what's happening here is we're actually running thousands and thousands of Bayesian regressions, five, six, seven thousand, and what this probability is in how many of those regressions did unemployment office show up as a predictor and how many of the office did filing for unemployment show up and so on. Okay, so the probability of inclusion is the probability of that variable being chosen as a predictor in these regressions. All right, let's give a different example. This is the new home sales in the U.S. Uh, it's also affectionately known as HSN1 FNSA and uh, what I did is I fed in the new home sales in the U.S and said, Google Correlate, find me the 100 best predictors of that series, or the best correlates of that series. And it said, well, the number one has got to be Tahitian nani juice, okay? Because it happens that Tahitian nani juice ended up getting popular just about the so time the housing bubble got going, and it became unpopular just about, uh, just about the time that it stopped going. So you're always going to run across that where you're dealing with this wealth of data, and you have to apply some uh, principal methods for making the choice. So if we look at these, we feed the, oh, here's a picture of 80-20 mortgage and uh, HSN1. So people who are querying on 80-20 mortgage, that seems to be pretty highly correlated with, the, uh, with this um, actual housing starts. Here's what the predictors are that are chosen by the model. Number one is appreciation rate about a 90% chance of inclusion. IRS 1031, which is a form you use to defer taxes on capital gains, Century 21 realtors, real estate purchases, so on, so on, so on. Uh, you find a predictive model. Let's see how well it does. So we're going to think about how much each of the predictors contributed 
to the model fit. So there's the model on top as a trend plus a seasonal plus some regressors. And we're going to plot first a trend, then the trend plus a seasonal, then the trend plus a seasonal plus the first predictor, trend plus seasonal plus second predictor, and so on. And what happens, there's our trend. Blue dots are the series we're trying to predict. The red line is the, is the common filter trend. There's the residuals down below. Here we add in the appreciation rate. Here we add in the IRS 1031, Century 21 Realtors, 8020 Mortgage. As what we used to call, I don't know if you guys remember, they had this thing called connect the dots econometrics. This is connect the dots econometrics here because with just those three or four explanatory variables, we end up getting a remarkably good fit to the time series. Now this is cheating, of course, because we're looking at in-sample fit. What you'd like to know is how does it work out of sample. So one thing you could do is you can estimate the model up to old time t and then forecast the next month and estimate it through t plus one, forecast the next month and so on. And you do about 23% better using those predictors, those four predictors that I showed you, than you do by just using a simple um, autoregression. So it is helpful in most of these, uh, most of these models. Here's another thing. Now I'm going to do the same stuff, but I'm going to do it cross-sectionally. This is based on a paper that Ed uh, Glacier wrote about unhappy cities. So it turns out the Center for Disease Control has a rolling survey. And in this rolling survey, they ask people, how satisfied are you with your life? Okay. And what Ed did is he looked at patterns in the uh, answers to that question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say what kinds of queries are in fact associated with happy places. All right, so let's look. Turns out gambling, <laughs> big, big negative predictor. And we dug into this a little bit. It's not that glamorous casino gambling. This is lotto, basically. So places are unhappy. You're going to see a lot of queries about lotto and gambling. Manufacturing, big negative. Frank will tell you about that. Uh, insurance, that's a positive predictor because it's a well, what do we call it? We call it a superior good or a normal good. Your income goes up, then you're more interested in insurance. You're too poor to afford insurance. That's not a very happy place. And so on and so on and so on. So you can see this probability of inclusion. This is a scatter plot of what the actual and predicted uh, queries look like. And everybody wants to know, where's the happiest city in the U.S.? Where's the unhappiest city in the U.S.? Well, it turns out, there they are. Charlottesville, Virginia is one of the happiest cities, and New York, New York is the un most unhappy city. So there you go. Maybe it's because of all that hangover queries that are occurring on. Anyway, here's another one. This is interesting. This was a story in the New York Times uh, a year or so ago. They looked at residents of Fairfax County are the longest lived in the country. Men have an average life expectancy of 82 about the same as Sweden. And McDowell County, on the other hand, the expected lifespan is 64 years, nearly 20 years less. And the amazing thing is, these are both in the same state. These are in the state of Virginia. One is around DC, where it's a very wealthy upmarket neighborhood, and the other is in Appalachia, where there's a lot of people who uh, are distressed in one way or another. So we said, what's the best predictor of the negative of life expectancy? That is, what's the best predictor of a short life? And number one query up there is blood pressure medicine. And then it goes to Obama is, major pain, against Obama, King James Bible, <laughs> and so on and so on. These are the queries that are the most predictive of, of a short lifespan. So this is just correlation, not causation, but my advice to you is, Never type those queries into Google. <laughs> you can't be too careful. So what we did then is we said, well, let's find the best regression. This is just bivariate correlation. This is what it looks like. If we look at negative of life expectancy in the search for blood pressure medication, you see what the heat map looks like. This is kind of the confederacy, I think, if you want to define it that way. And if you look at the predictors of morbidity, number one are queries on Obama says, full-figured woman, which I take as a proxy for obesity, blood pressure medicine, gunshot wounds, 40 caliber, etc. That's your model to predict morbidity as a function of queries. 
And everybody might say, what is that Obama business up there? Well, if you type in Google suggests, go to Google says, says he's God, there are 57 states, serve Satan, you know, so on. So they're sort of <laughs> what you might generally consider to be anti-Obama uh, queries, okay? <laughs> All right, Google consumer surveys. Now the first two tools that I showed you, Google Trends and Google Correlate are absolutely free. Anybody can use them, play with them, download the data, do the kind of analysis I described here. Google Consumer Surveys is actually a commercial product. It's a way to do a very lightweight and simple survey. Now here I am at maybe the capital of survey research in the world. So uh, I don't want to say this displaces any other kind of survey, but it's very useful for doing very simple, cheap, quick uh, surveys. So the way it works is you, the researcher, create an online survey, and it's like a tweet of surveys. Could be a single sentence with a word limit or character limit, and then a few multiple choice answers, but it has to be very, very simple and pose essentially no cognitive load on the individual. You know, which color do you like best or something like that. People complete the questions to access premium content, and what that looks like is you might be on the web and you're looking, in this case, I was looking at, at Business Week, and up comes a question that says, in order to continue reading this page, please answer this question. You answer the question and you get admitted to the premium content. So what's happening is, instead of having an ad that says, look at this ad and I'll show you some content, here we're saying, answer this little question and then I'll use that as the contribution to show you the content that you're looking for. So what happens then is the publishers get paid just like an ad, right? Just when people look at their ad or click on their ad, they get paid. Here they're paid when people answer the survey question. So that's very handy little exchange. And then you get the nicely aggregated and analyzed data. So the way it works is it costs you, you the researcher, it costs 10 cents an answer. So you get a thousand responses for $100. And uh, the publisher gets half of that. So that's, and that's great because that's a $50 CPM. So it's a lot, lot better than the amount they would get from an ad. So now anybody can do these surveys, right? Anybody can write one of these surveys. The cost is dramatically lower than you'd find with conventional techniques. The results come back in a few hours because there are tens of thousands of people that are looking at this content. You can use it to try to replicate surveys that you've seen somewhere else, and you can do, help you with the design because you can examine sensitivity to different kinds of wording. So even, now, now the defect is, of course, it's not you know, random digit dialing or it's not random selection. You're looking at the people who are looking at this online content. So it is a uh, different, uh, different framework. So here's a little example. Pew asked a question, if you were asked to use one of these commonly used names for social classes, which would you say belong to? They ran a random digit dialing survey on the telephone for preferred methodology. Uh, except you do wonder these days, given all of those annoying phone calls, you've got to be pretty unusual to actually answer one of these calls. So it's, they're getting lower and lower response rates. Uh, I ran this on Google Consumer Surveys, and middle class was about 45% of the answers, lower middle 21, and so on. You can actually dive, do a deep dive into inferred demographics. Those are not stated demographics. Those are demographics inferred from web visits. So people who visit a lot of sites that females visit, and they'll say, oh, it's probably a female. And if people visit a lot of sites that 25 to 34-year-old people visit, it's probably somebody in that age group, and so on. So it's inferred demographics. But you can slice and dice if, if you want using those things. This is a picture of what Pew got in black and what Google Consumer Survey got in gray. So one of the things I've been doing with this tool is just trying to see how well it aligns with existing survey methods. And for some things that are very intensively online activities, it's going to be different because here we're just sampling the online world and the other we're sampling telephone world. But then again, with the telephone world, landlines, you know, <laughs> that is really in flux as well. So it's not always so clear which, is, which you should really define as, as ground truth. In any event, we can use the Google Consumer Surveys to do all sorts of interesting things. In this particular case, a company came to us 
Google and said, you know, we have the only smartphone that's designed, engineered, and assembled in America. Should we tout that? And I said, let's run a survey. It's a great opportunity. So he said, I prefer to buy products that are assembled in America. Strongly agree, agree, neutral, mildly disagree, and so on. And so we could get this survey response and we could look at the geographic distribution. But then we could combine these survey results with the methodology I showed you earlier, where we could say, well, what characteristics of searches are predictive of the survey responses? Not at an individual level, but at a geographic level. So look at the geography of where these search responses come from, and then find the queries that are the most predictive of that, uh, those answers. And so here we did that. So it turns out places where there are a lot of queries on Chevrolet, firearms and weapons, country music, and trucks are very likely to be strongly interested in assembled in America. So it's kind of an interesting little picture. The top places, South Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia, South Carolina, all these places here. Bottom places, well, Mountain View, San Jose, <laughs> Berkeley. You know, you can see those, those West Coast, uh, West Coast people. So it's kind of a nice picture. What that means from the marketing point of view, if you were marketing your product, you would say, boy, this message really resonates with people in this area, oh, sorry, in this area, but I shouldn't even bother in this area. Another, I didn't put up a slide for this, but another feature of this particular phone is you could choose your colors and trim, so you could kind of design your own phone and we put out a question that says, I'd really like to be able to choose the colors and trim for my mobile phone. And we looked at the answers, did the same analysis. It's like a completely different group. It's urbanistas, young women, people who uh, were doing queries on fashion and other things of this sort. So you got a completely different message for those geographic areas and you would market your product accordingly of trying to get the characteristics that were most appealing to the given geography would be the ones that were emphasized in ads to that geography, which is very helpful from the viewpoint of, of marketing. This is what the Assembled in America looks like, and you can see this area where people really strongly resonate with that, uh, that particular message. So we call that geo-amplification, because we can take a survey and amplify it. We can amplify it by kind of interpolating or extrapolating in one sense, this is what social scientists have done for many decades, because you'll run a survey or you'll collect some geographically distributed data, and then you'll run a regression where there's your variable of interest on one side and demographics like age and gender and education and housing prices and all this stuff on the other side. Well, here, what we've done is we've said, look, you have millions and millions of more predictors on top of those demographic characteristics because you have the kinds of queries that emanate from geographies are a potential distinguishing feature that could be interesting just in the ways I showed you, uh, showed you here. I'll give you this example from New York Times Index of Hard Places. This was kind of follow up to that longevity thing. They constructed an index uh, where they looked at education, income, um, health, other things of that sort, and just construct an index to measure the hard places to live in the U.S. and the easy places to live in the U.S. And so I said, well, what do the queries look like that are associated with the hard places and the easy places? There's the queries that are the most predictive of hard places. Social security, disability, free diabetic, cheat code central, ways to lower blood pressure, antichrist, the rapture, social security, disability, and so on. And you get a, this is just done at the state level here, but you get a pretty good uh, fit uh, just using Google Correlate and finding the queries that are most predictive, best regression model from those uh, queries for the uh, state level data. Here's the easy places, a solo 401k. That's a 401k that's only got one participant. You don't find that in low income areas very much. SX, whoops, SX uh, 210 IS, that threw me off. I had no idea what that was. It turns out it was a very popular digital camera that was uh, used in those areas. Olympic medals, jogger, and so on. And there's what the regression line looks there. So these, these, this predictor, this solo 401k, is a really good predictor of whether you're in a kind of upscale uh, place. 
they can use the same statistical te techniques for model selection with other data. I didn't want to make this entirely about Google data. We developed these techniques for Google data. In fact, you can do it with regular econometric data. I'm going to give you two quick examples of that. One is uh, some uh, people at Kotak Institutional Equity sent me a report where they built a model to forecast the Brexit vote, or not to forecast, but to a prediction of the Brexit vote. So they took these uh, numbers, whether the uh, fraction of the people that had no passport in a given area, the fraction of the people that turned out for a referendum, and so on, and they said, what is the best model for the way people voted, in this case voting to leave, uh, based on these possible predictors, and it turns out the four big predictors were here, uh, and then they said, let's take those same numbers and apply them to France. <coughs> so they would say, here's how these socioeconomic characteristics predicted the vote in England. What would happen if you had a referendum in France and the voting patterns had the same relationship that they had in England? That's a hypothesis, of course, but uh, what happens is you end up with about 65% of the electorate would vote to, uh, vote to leave. So you get a pretty uh, strong effect there. And you could do the same thing for other uh, countries, of course. Here's a model where we said, let's try to predict recessions. And this is based on a paper by Bear, Sinhan, Smolinski, Smolinski, which market indicators best forecast recession. It's a note from the Federal, um, Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And what's interesting is they took these variables here as the potential predictors. These are all macroeconomic variables of one sort or another, available on a monthly basis. And we ran it through our model, and it turns out basically the really big deal is employment, and then the slope of the yield curve, essentially. Uh, so if you want to build a predictive model for th recessions three months out, uh, those, that's where all the action is in those variables. If you want to do it 12 months out, it turns out it's all in financial market variables. And this is, this is what they found using their uh, technique, but we could get uh, essentially the same answers by using this variable selection mechanism I just described. And it does a pretty good job if you look at it. Here's the, uh, here's the, pre the blue lines, are, this is when you're in a recession, in a recession, down here is when you're not in a recession. And so you get a pretty good uh, forecast of when you're likely to go into recession three months out. And you could do different horizons and so on. So that's using just purely macroeconomic data of a standard sort, nothing, nothing from Google there, but the method is still quite attractive, I think. Okay, so the summary here is there's a lot of really good data in the private sector. The Google Trends is an example, the Google Correlate, some surveys, but also UPS, Visa, Walmart, FedEx, all these companies have real-time data systems. They're allowing them to see what's going on in their business now. On the other hand, if you look at the data from government agencies, it's long historical series, very carefully constructed, usually low frequency, monthly data or uh, sometimes quarterly data, very labor-intensive with delayed release and three or four different revisions. So these are very complementary kinds of data. You have this high frequency, highly detailed data in the private sector. You have this low frequency, carefully constructed, long historical trends in the, in the government data. And I think a real challenge facing our profession is try to combine these two kinds of data sets to get a superior model of what's going on in the economy, either now or in the near future, or maybe even uh, longer term uh, sorts of trends. So that's my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And I want to see a lot of senior theses come out of this, uh, this data. OK, thank you. <laughs> and we do have time for questions and answers. Oh, see, one of these front row students. He's, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. This is good. But uh, just on this uh, research and Google search, uh, Charlie Brown and I were wondering how is the U.S. pension system doing during the Great Recession with defined contributions? Ah. And what is the most highly Google searched term? Withdrawal penalty. 
withdrawal penalties. <laughs> yes. People were taking money out. You can yeah, see this yeah. huge uptick on Google. Yeah. It's kind of a new very, one. very interesting. So you can see where the pension system is headed yeah. in terms of people thinking of it as an ATM. Yep. Well, well I mean, interesting. one of the things that would be interesting to look at, are there, are there aggregate figures on withdrawals? We have them in the PSID. Yeah, so you could look, look at, at this cross-sectional data and then try to figure out what, what kind of characteristics were associated with those withdrawals. Very interesting. Probably the, I mean, one thing I know from looking at this data that the sand states show up a lot. I mean, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, California, you really see, the, um, you really see them very prominently in, the, in the, anything to do with housing. Yeah, neat. Yes? Um. So I was wondering whether there's any analog or could be one of Google Trends and Google Correlate going back in history before we yeah. were using Google. So you have all this data on books and newspapers right. and so on. And so I do work on the 1930s, and I wonder whether one could find out what are people writing about when the unemployment rate is higher. Well, you're really in luck because we have Google Ngrams. And Google Ngrams are, in fact, a way to search the corpus from the Google Library Project and find phrases that occur uh, in, in earlier periods. So it's not as flexible as you would like for your research, but I'll bet you can get some insights out of it. It's quite interesting to look at when you're looking for a history of thought and sort of topics that occur in various areas and are, and are uh, popular during certain periods. So I, I would certainly take a look at Google, Google uh, engrams for this. Well, it yeah, turns out, it. yeah, it turns out that when you look at it, we've got this hourly frequency now, which is pretty high frequency, but a lot of the market is moving on millisecond frequencies. So it's, it's still a long distance from what would be helpful in doing any kind of trading. However, I can tell you for a fact that there are plenty of uh, institutions outside of Google that are looking uh, at queries on, let's say, movie openings. So you look at uh, how Disney's movie, latest movie, is doing relative to its other movies and getting an idea of how that might impact the bottom line. So it's a tool that's available for anybody to use, including uh, funds that are following events having to do with uh, earnings reports and that kind of stuff. So it can be done. Ten minutes before the food is ready, so uh, <laughs> you have plenty of time to think of questions. Um, this is like not really an economics question, but how much like personally identifiable data is identifiable off of a certain query that you put into Google? Like, how much would Google know about me if I just searched one of these search terms? So basically, it does the same thing that's in any web log, namely this IP address, this time, this URL, and so on. So that's essentially it's what any website has in its web logs. And then the question is, how do you identify that, um, you know, that uh, personally identifiable information? Well, if you're logged in when you do the search, it knows your login. So you can look at persistence over time. Uh, if you go to um, Google Web History, you can see your web history. You can opt in and say, or opt out if you want, say, don't, don't collect my web history. Uh, if you go to ads, um, what's it called, ads preferences, you can look at a little uh, list of the kinds of sites that you visit. Now, just make everybody comfortable. These are totally innocuous categories. There's nothing about health. There's nothing about sensitive subjects. It's all things like this, this person visits a lot of sites about soccer or something or fishing or things of this sort. because. What people are doing with that information is they're interested in showing you ads that are uh, aligned with your interests. So that's the kind of data that's there. It's all publicly, I mean, it's all available to any individual who wants to look at that uh, at, at his or her own site or his or her own uh, 
query history. Is there any prospect for getting access for researchers to some of the microdata? Uh, not as, obviously not all of Google's data, but to do something like this, you know, subtrends. Yeah. Um, well, like what? Sub well, meaning? Well, I guess I'm thinking if you, you, it would be interesting to be able to see a panel where you look at individuals uh, over time, maybe look at yeah. a random sample, but you maybe can infer some demographic information right. about the individual, that sort of thing. Right. So I should say on the Google Trends, it does have a privacy filter in you have to have at least a certain number of queries from distinct IP addresses before it shows up in the data set, and that's for privacy reasons. But uh, your question is, there is another panel. There's a panel uh, of mobile phone users who opt into the panel. It's kind of like a Nielsen panel or any other media panel, and they agree to answer a certain number of questions per week, and in exchange, they get credit to download videos and music and this sort of stuff. Now, of course, that's a specific demographic, because it'd be a specific demographic that's most interested in that topic, uh, on, the, on, the, on that kind of content, but uh, it is a demographic that's very interesting to marketing people, and if you're studying young people's behavior, then uh, that would be very helpful. So for that group, mobile phone users who want to be compensated by music and video downloads, uh, that group, you can get a panel. Is that available? Yeah, so that's available. Well, you, again, you have to run the surveys. Okay. So it, it could still cost you the 10 cents an answer sort of thing, but you can do it from a panel, uh, you know, using panel techniques if you want. Yeah, so you could ask, for example, it would be interesting to look at student loans or something of that sort where that would play a role in uh, interest from that from that particular group. Yeah, back in the court, back there. Somebody got a mic. Well, it's being recorded. recorded yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, just seems like um, nowadays with the um, switching from the survey using the Pew or research to the Google um, the survey conduct method. Do you think there is a improvement of the quality of the data? Because it seems like when, when I saw the slides of how Americans perceive themselves, it seems like the mid-class had identified more trend, um, transitioning from middle class to poor class, lower class and upper class. So do you think switching from the Pew Research to the Google survey, do you think quality of data is significantly improved by the well, I, I, w I wouldn't think so because I don't see a reason to switch. I see these methods as complementary because there are different views on the same underlying reality. And I'm really glad you reminded me. I didn't really tell you the punchline of that data. The punchline was that, that after the recession, a lot more people perceived themselves as being lower middle or lower class than had been the case prior to the recession. And that story comes out in both the Google Consumer Survey and also in the data from Pew. So in that case, they're telling you the same story. Um, and if, if you look at other examples of this, let's see, I had some, yeah, you can ask questions about political attitudes, for example. Overall, international trade has been a good thing for the U.S. economy. Agree, strongly agree, et cetera. You can look at the answers to that question. You can slice and dice by the demographics. You can look at the regional variation. And so you can collect that data set in a matter of, of literally in a matter of a day or two with no setup costs. So being able to do that quick view is very, very helpful. But I would have to say, you must keep in mind that this is a population that's selected according to certain characteristics. For one thing, they're looking at online news sources, right? So there are a lot of these questions show up in, um, in news media and so on. So it's not a sample from the population as a whole, it's a selected sample. Professor Barry. Yep. Um, you've uh, transitioned from a very successful career in academics to a very successful career in tech in Silicon Valley. And in both of those roles, um, you've done a lot to clarify the value of information, different kinds of information. From your current vantage point, looking back at universities and graduate programs and economics or other social sciences, 
Are there things that you wish that universities or graduate programs were doing better or more of now uh, than they are? Very good question. Uh, I would say I, I think a lot of times when we're in academia, we'll have some solved problem or some specific model or some uh, empirical analysis and it's presented as a finished product. And you know, in real life, it's not that easy <laughs> because what happens is when people in academia are doing research, they went down a lot of blind alleys and they got this right and changed this and new data came in and this was adjusted. And when you're, when you're doing research at, you know, at uh, in an industry, it's the same thing. It's messy data. It comes in and over time, your views evolve as you study and so on. And one of the things I think we should do with our students is give them some more experience in the unfinished data, you know, where you have to work on something that is um, uh, messier, more like real life than some of the pristine models that we see in the classroom. It's good to show those too. I mean, you can't do everything, but I think it's important to understand that uh, a lot of this work is going to involve an iterative process that doesn't just jump out you know, at, at you as a great inspiration and something that requires a lot of, uh, of digging. And of course, researchers who work in this area know this well, uh, but I don't think it's always conveyed that well to the students, which is an important, uh, important thing to do. Hi, I have a small question. I've worked with Google Ngrams a little bit, and I had a quick question. Um, so you can search by English words, and I was wondering if there was a way or if there's element on like differentiating that by country. You know, so comparing English words used in UK versus US, or even you know published by state, or you know, kind of additional attributes. Yeah, so you can also search for foreign words, but they'll be mostly foreign words that occur in English language libraries. And the reason for that is in the US, we have this fair use doctrine. And the Supreme Court finally, after a long uh, set of legal proceedings, as, as, sorry, the, the district court, and then said that the, uh, this was indeed counted as fair use, and the Supreme Court didn't hear the appeal, or we don't think they're gonna hear the appeal. And uh, you know, so we, ha we can use this data. We, meaning scholars in the US, can use it. In continental Europe, they don't have a fair use provision, and so uh, scanning information from books in um, Europe is not going to happen until there's enabling legislation, so. That's the, that's the way it is, unfortunately. Any other questions? Um, well, we are uh, to thank Hal again. Okay, thank you.